Welcome into the midweek edition of the MMA Report Podcast. It is our preview of UFC 288, and we're going to break this one down for you. We got a ton of other things to talk about. We got to recap our April draft of fights, which a uh, little teaser Daniel kicked my ass in that draft. Uh, so I got to see if I can rebound here in the month of May. Also, we'll talk about uh, other things going on in the world of MMA. Of course, uh, there's the Pelotor sell rumors out there. Of course, as I mentioned, we're going to preview UFC 288. Going to tell you about the great offers that two of our sponsors have for you. That is Harry's and Sunday's. Harry's coming in in the clutch for me as I've been on the road this uh, these past couple of days. And well, I get back on the road again tomorrow. So uh, Harry's coming in clutch for me as always. We appreciate their support of the podcast. But Dan, you know, we always kind of joke on this show about we, we sit here, we record the show and then news breaks. So I'm just going to say, hey, Bellator, all you fine people over there, thank you. Thank you for earlier today announcing that Chris Cyborg has re-signed with Bellator. Not really surprised her, but Bellator, I love you over there. I love I love my Bellator peeps, but come on. Can we not go Bellator MMA re-signs world's greatest female MMA fighter and featherweight world champion Chris Cyborg? Because I'm sorry. She's one of the greatest. She's not better but, than the man Nunez. Yeah, I was going to say uh, – as long as her birth certificate doesn't say Amanda Nunez, she ain't the goat. All right. Chris Cyborg is one of the greatest. She's a legend. And there was a point in time where she was the greatest female fighter of all time. And then Amanda Nunez got a championship around her waist and she kept it for a very long time, ended up losing one of them only to come back and, and, and uh, get that ish back. Amanda is clearly the best female fighter of all time. Bellator, congratulations on re-signing Chris Cyborg. She's a hell of a talent. She'll give you some nice championship fights, maybe down the line, a fight with Kayla Harrison. But don't <laughs> BS us. Why are, you, why are you laughing over there, Jason? What's going on? What, what's got you all giggly? You know exactly why I'm laughing over here, and that is because if you go to the old Twitter machine, Ali Abdelaziz going full Dana White here. As he tweeted earlier today, quote, Cyborg never wanted to fight Kayla. Then follows up that tweet going, all along I knew Cyborg was not going to sign with promotions Kayla was fighting. All right. He, he, he clearly read the Dana White handbook. Yeah. Avoid the money. Don't talk about the money. The guarantees, the contract, the, the, the relationship between fighter and promoter. Let's create a whole new reality that tries to pressure people into doing what we want. That is the playbook of Dana. That is the playbook of what Ali is trying to throw down. And look, Ali is managing Kayla. That's his client. Mm -hmm. His goal is to get Kayla and Cyborg to get in a cage under Kayla's terms. But he, to me, is not doing himself any favors in terms of making this fight a reality by talking crap on social media. All it does is kind of push away the chance of Chris wanting to do business with him and with Kayla Harrison. But it's clear that if this fight ever happens now, it will likely happen in a Bellator cage. I don't think that fight will happen, though. I, I do think Kayla's going to fight out her contract and then sign with the UFC. Obviously, Harrison has to win her next few fights for that to be a reality. Imagine her losing the next two. And I believe she has two fights, correct? Yes. Am I wrong? Yeah. So she's got two fights. A sky has fallen scenario for Kayla is if she loses two. I don't necessarily know where her marketability is as a free agent with three losses in a row. But if she does win those two, I sadly, maybe Cyborg making that Bellator deal makes the Kayla fight not a reality. Yeah. By the way, Chris Cyborg, and I don't know whether this was her or someone on her team. But she has a tweet, it's her pen tweet as we do the show. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty at Bellator May Alpha Cats and Not bad. Not bad. Look, look, I'll say this. I've heard the rum wings. Bellator's tried to make this matchup for some time. Um, it, look, if I'm Bellator, if Cats and Gano doesn't want to take this fight right now, you just turn right to Sarah Mango. Sarah, do you want the fight or no? Yeah. And, and Sarah's a, obviously not the exact same fighter as Kayla Harrison. But she's going to present a lot of the same problems that Kayla's going to throw at Cyborg. So that would be a very interesting fight. And I think that's the type of matchup that is the worst for Chris Cyborg. And I believe 
that we are in agreement when it comes to the fact that Sarah McMahon is more likely to beat Cyborg than Zingano. And it simply comes down to the fact that the pathway to victory is just easier for Sarah. Utilize wrestling. It's difficult to do so against Chris Cyborg, right? She's been facing that battle her entire career because of how dangerous she is on the feet. But Sarah has a much better chance of beating Chris Cyborg. And for Kat Zingano, I, I think it's the fight to take because for Kat, the fight against Chris Cyborg will simply be the biggest fight she's got left in her career. I, I thought this quote from Chris in the press release was very telling. She says, after receiving multiple offers from several promotions, I'm very happy that I was able to come to terms with Bellator and remain the face of their women's division. Scott Coker is a promoter that I've worked with and respected for many years. He's done so much to further women's MMA give us a platform to showcase our skills when making this decision. It was important to me that I was signing with an organization that I felt had the biggest names in the top town, 145 pounds for me to challenge myself against. There's no question that all the top female featherweights are signed with Bellator. So I can't wait to get back in there and defend my belt. Now, as a voter in the Bellator ranking system, there's only like six fires to rank on. Yeah, I mean, saying that you have the best featherweight division, women's featherweight division, is is not a, a an impressive statement. The women's featherweight division only has four or five quality fighters, and it really only has two fighters that should be fighting at that weight class. Eight fighters. I, and, I just logged. I just logged into the ranking system. There are eight fighters eligible to be voted in at women's one forty five. And you could make the case that the UFC featherweight division is better than the Bellator featherweight division just because the UFC has Amanda Nunez. Like, she might be so good that she overtakes the whole Bellator featherweight roster. Uh, but simply put, I mean, the featherweight class is just a – it's the Sahara Desert of mixed martial arts. There just ain't a whole lot there except Chris Cyborg knocking people out. In terms of now, we talk about Bellator. Their other thing has been kind of in. I don't know if it was, it's been the rumor mill. And and look, this isn't this isn't anything shocking about Bellator. You know, potentially being on the market. These rumors have been out there for some time. You know, the PFL one is an interesting one because you know I think when you look at Bellator, I don't think we anyone would deny the fact that they have the second best roster in all of mixed martial arts behind the UFC. I don't, I don't think anyone would deny that, but the problem they face is while they may have the second best roster, the PFL has the second best broadcasting deal. Yeah. Yeah. And the PFL does a really good job of getting themselves on ESPN, not just their fight cards, but whenever cool things happen, it's on sports center mm -hmm. top 10. They also have done a much better job of getting their fighters and talent on the MA Hour with Ariel Hawani. Those are two avenues to get eyeballs on your product and get people talking. The PFL has done a much better job of promoting their product than Bellator. They just have in when it comes to getting things out in the media landscape. Bellator does have more quality fighters. I think the best way to really gauge who has the best roster is maybe one of these days we'll have to do a draft of non-UFC fighters if we were going to create a company and then we can kind of look at how many fighters from each promotion get drafted to see who really are the most valuable non-UFC fighters obviously number one would be Francis Ngannou but he certainly doesn't have a company he's working with but Jason to circle back on what you're saying PFL makes a lot of sense because Bellator has what PFL needs high quality mixed martial artists PFL has plenty or PFL has some of those fighters, but they could use a whole hell of a lot more. And it would be great to see the Bellator fighters within that PFL infrastructure. And it would be ironic, if it does happen, that Bellator fighters would once again find themselves in a tournament format. I would be somewhat surprised if that ever comes together. I think that, you know, you know look... Everyone's heard the rumors out there. I think that a lot of the players that were, you know, players into buying the WWE will also be players into potentially buying Bellator. I mean, I, I think if if I'm if I am if I'm someone in Bellator and you're coming to a realization that Paramount either sells off 
a good amount of the, the, the company to somebody or sells out totally. The hope has got to be to find a better broadcasting platform, you know, because you know, problem is when you're on showtime, it's just, it's a limited amount of people that you could potentially get to. And so, I mean, look, these rumors are going to kind of, you know, be out there for a while and uh, you know, look, we'll, we'll see what kind of happens there. You know, you mentioned about Francis and Gano. Look, he's clearly, we all know he's PFL bound. I mean, let's just call it what it is. He's PFL bound. I mean, we, we all see his coming and I mean, look, I, I, some of the stuff that's out there, you know, the, the problem I still say with the Francis to the PFL is what the hell gets you excited on Francis Ngannou fighting in the PFL on a PFL pay-per-view against what opponent? It's it's a tough one. At the end of the day, if they get Francis, PFL is going to have the second best heavyweight in the world. I feel like he's behind John. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a hell of a fighter to have. Um, opportunity to sell pay-per-views but jason i'm i'm with you right like roy nelson isn't going to move the fit move the needle um any of the previous pfl heavyweight champions aren't going to move the needle brock lesnar would move the needle that's not going to happen i don't know is fedor a free agent let's not make that happen that would be murder <laughs> I, okay so i just went over to tapology and so i'm just kind of here here's what's crazy about these tapology rankings the fact that where do you think Francis Ngannou is on the topology rankings? I really don't know how the formula works. I don't know how this formula works, but he so should what? not be thirteenth. Yeah, he yeah. should not be in the. I mean, in the heavyweight division. Yeah, I'm, I'm literally going down. Oh, that's the that's first insane. Bellator, or excuse me, first first Bellator fighters Ryan Bader at twentieth. Which that's a good fight. I mean, I, I think you could put that one on pay-per-view. It wouldn't do gangbusters. Good Lord. But. I, I'm just I'm just trying to go through and say, which one's the first PFL guy that sticks out to me? Uh, uh, Anti-Delasia is 27th. That's your first PFL fight. I got go to go to the Fight Matrix. Let me see what Fight Matrix has a heavyweight. They got to have, it got to has to be one or two. It has to be. Yeah. Bruno Capelozo is a name, but again, that's not going to sell you anything. I mean, if Holy you're crap. if you what? Maybe, maybe it's because he's been inactive for as long. Where is? I'm over on Fight Matrix now. I'm down to 23. So be- not, I've not seen Francis Ngannou's name. So maybe maybe there's an ineligibility thing for that. But well, I guess the, they have to just look at. Maybe the biggest Francis Ngannou fight that the PFL can make is going to be a Curtis Blades, right? Like maybe I, it, at it, some it, point the UFC parts ways to Curtis. And it's that funny. It. It's funny you say that because I was thinking after he lost to Pavlovich, like that may be the perfect opportunity for the UFC to decide, hey, we really, we really don't want to be in the Curtis Blades business. It's because we just see it all the time. That's why I think both of us pointed it out is if you have a fighter who's really talented – but is it the most exciting more often than not? They tend to part ways. Look at John Fitch as an example. And, and, and Blades could be one too. He's one of the best heavyweights in the world. But, you know, maybe the PFL signs Francis. The UFC decides to remain in the in the Razor Blades business. But, yeah, uh, once again, just to circle back, there isn't an intriguing challenger for heavyweight. I mean, maybe Josh Barnett. Francis would probably run through him because of his age. But Josh Barnett is a name you could throw out there. Would I watch Francis Ngannou and Tim Sylvia? Yes. That fight shouldn't get legalized, but I would watch it. You know, Fabricio Verdum was, I think, is another name, even though I did find this interesting, and I got to kind of figure out what's going on here. So Verdum has not fought since uh, 2021, but on the MMA registry, it says this fighter is currently serving a suspension by an ABC recognized athletic commission, the uh, New Jersey state athletic commission. So uh, that, that could be something as a, more of a clerical thing that maybe he just has to get a, a doctor to say everything is okay. Sometimes that happens. So uh, when uh, someone had mentioned that to me in a DM earlier today, and when I looked up Verdum, I mean, Verdum's got the name. I mean, I, I just, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how the PFL does. It. I mean, obviously, Verdum's going to be a part of their their pay-per-view platform. But, you know, we'll see what kind of happens, uh, you know, in terms of Fabricio Verdum, uh, in, in terms of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, before we get into UFC 288, we got to talk about our, our draft from uh, April. You kicked my ass. 
I can admit I, it. You kicked I, my ass. Let, read, read off the fights that we each had. Let's take a look right, back. So uh, let, let's give my crappy roster. So we had, uh, I went, my first round pick was uh, Max Holloway and Arnold Allen. Good fight. You know, not, not some of the bangers that you had. Uh, yeah. One banger that I definitely had was Adrian Yanez and Rob Font. Uh, great another great knockout. Unfortunately for my, my, my uh, guy did not go too well for him. Billy Q against Edson Barboza. Uh, I had Pico Rodriguez. That fight never happened. Uh, another fight never happened that I had was uh, Armin and Hinato. So that did not happen. Then I, you know, and, and you said this before the show, I went too I went too heavy on PFL Went too heavy on the PFL Had some duds. Uh, so PFL fights I had was Wilkinson Santos, Laughlin, Morais, OAB, Burgos, uh, Pacheco, and Bud. Also, Bellator, I had Carmouche and Ben. Now, let's look over your rock star roster over here uh, where you kicked my ass. So, you went uh, Alex and Izzy. We all know how that went. Burns, Mazzal. Uh, and, and you even mentioned this when it happened. You said, hey, I'm going for the name value here. Uh, but the you know, fight wasn't exactly very good. Stotts Mix, great one. Then you had Roy Val, Nick Clow, great pick. Song and Ricky Simone. We saw that last week. A great knockout there by uh, Song in the fifth round. Then you have Pavlich and Blades. Of course, so we just talked about that. what happened there. Of course, you did have a canceled matchup in Borg and Horiguchi. That's not your fault. That right Borg can't make it anymore. <laughs> you had Holland and Ponsonibio. Uh Then you had Jacoby fight. And then also you had the uh, Chris Gutierrez fight. So, yeah, you ki- you kicked my ass in uh, in the month of April. I, 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 well, I, can sit, I can sit here and gladly admit that you kicked my ass. You know, um... Thank you, and I feel like the opportunity is going to be in your court. You know, when we draft fights for May, uh, you're going to get the first pick. Um, you know, side note that I just realized, you know, I'm from the Rio Grande Valley, and you look at that May 20th fight night, you got two Rio Grande Valley fighters on that damn car, bro, Diego Ferreira and Gilbert Urbina. Holy crap, that is I, awesome. As I was riding down fights, I go, so how high do I take Michael Johnson versus Diego Fajay just to piss off Daniel? Yeah, that's my number one pick. I dare you to take it. I definitely <laughs> won't take Sterling Zahudo. I mean, I don't even know why you're making the first pick because that's the obvious one. But um, that, that, before we... Yes, that will be the obvious one. But but before we get into this, I do want to let you know our May draft is brought to you by Harry's. Of course, we've been telling you about Harry's now for a couple of months now. Absolutely great product. And, man, I got to tell you what. I've been in Orlando the past couple of days, and Harry's came in critical for me. Got Had had, had that Daniel little scruffy look going, so I had to get shaved up. That yeah, trial set they sent me over there, great shaving gel. You trimmed myself up, man. Harry's just hit right on the spot. And the thing that I love about Harry's is they just make it so easy well you know you go to whether store you go to like here in tampa i'm either shopping at target i'm shopping at Publix, and you go down that razor aisle it is very difficult to decide what you want but daniel harry's makes it so easy dude i had to shave my entire body this past weekend all right i was wrestling at a south texas comic-con and your boy is harry literally i'm like a werewolf and i used harry's blade i used the shaving cream and I shaved myself, man, and it was just a great, great experience. I cannot recommend Harry's enough. If you're a guy, you shave, man. Harry's is the blade. They've got the products that you need. The blades are amazing. You can tell they're custom made. They're amazing. They're made in their own factory in Germany. They hold up better than ever, man. You know, guys who try it say their eighth shave is as good as their first. And I can advocate and tell you that is absolutely true. The other thing is the deal that we're offering you is absurd, dude. At harrys.com slash MA report, the starter set, something worth $13. Bro, you get it for just $3. You can find that change in your car console. And I can tell you what. I got a little bit of scruff right now because I just started a new job and I've been working hard. I cannot wait for the weekend, Jason. I'm gonna grab that Harry's blade. I'm gonna grab that shaving cream, and I'm gonna I'm gonna shave away until I got the skin of a baby's bottom. 
Look, I'll be up in Tallahassee this weekend for my niece's graduation, so I'm taking my Harry starter set with me. And like Daniel said, get the thir- it's a $13 value. You just get for $3. That's right, $3. I mean, come on. How, I mean, you probably spend more than $3 when you go to your local fast food restaurant. I know I do that. So be sure to take advantage of the offer they have. Save the hassle, set up your delivery, and get the best quality shave with Harry's. Get a $13 starter set for just $3 at harrys.com slash M Mayorport. That's harrys.com slash M Mayorport for a $3 starter set. When you hit that URL, let them know that you heard about here on the M Report. We'll have that link in the show notes so you take advantage of that offer that Harry's has now. So we look over to this May draft. Uh, so uh, you, you already said I get the first pick. Well, that's pretty easy. It, it's it's yeah, to me. So, it's, so it, Jason, it, Jason picks uh, Matt Brown and Court McGee with his first pick, and I will go next. Oh, Oh uh, no! Who are, you, who are you picking? Oh, I am going out though in Cejudo. No question about it in my mind. Damn! I, or Aljo, I I gonna... Aljo, Cejudo. Why did I say Aldo? I'll give Aljo you. I'll give you, I'll give you Aldo and Cejudo, and I will take Aljo. And Cejudo. <laughs> are we doing? I can't remember. Is this a snake or are we? We did. We did. We did a, I think we did a snake last time. Yeah. Okay. Well. All right. So look, you took the best pick for sure. And now I gotta, I gotta, I gotta rebound because there's a big drop off, man. Um, you're selling a pay per view without a doubt. Look, I'm just gonna go with what I believe, and, and I will say this much: the month of May is a worse month for fights than the month of April. I, I will say that without a doubt. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, the one thing is, yeah. you only have one Bellator card. You have no PFL card, uh, and we only have three UFC cards. Yeah, so look at me, look yes. at me going. We, we only have three UFC cards. Only have three UFC cards, and uh, I'm going to go with the co-main event that we're about to watch: Muhammad versus Burns. Is my first pick, and like I'm going to swing over and get uh, Jaizirna Rosenstruck and, and Jaiatin Almeida for my co-main events. Okay, they're, uh, they're okay. The fight night, they're the fight night a week after. They were they were uh, on my potential pick for my second round pick. I thought you might take my other oh, uh, for a second round. Pick. I know, I know what you. I know who you're taking. Damn it! I screwed up. I know who you're taking. Who do you think I'm, I'm taking? Off, but are you definitely going to take the DJ fight? Yep, 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 yep. Give, give me DJ hemorrhoids. Come on, tomorrow night live on uh, Amazon Prime. I'll be. Uh, I'll probably be getting up to Tallahassee right around this thing is starting. I will say it's Cinco de Mayo, so you know. Let's just say when I went a little shopping today. I definitely got that 12 pack of Modellos. I'll get that fighting spirit ready to go for me uh, tomorrow night in Tallahassee. Gosh, I hope you have a great time, man. I hope you have a great time, but uh, I hate you because you're kicking my ass uh, through four picks. You are absolutely wiping the floor with me, man. So so I'm up next here with my third pick. This is where it gets kind of uh, interesting. I think this fight ends up, you know, being a, a solid fight with a solid result. Give me Anthony Smith versus Johnny Walker, which is the co-main event of next week's UFC Charlotte. Which, by the way, that main card's on ABC. Yeah, that's a good one, man. Uh, I think we're we're getting in the that that that's on ABC. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's an afternoon card on ABC. Oh wow, interesting. Well, I mean, there's a couple good things on there, some exciting fights, but. Uh, for me, for my next pick, man, gosh, I think I'm going to go chalk. I'm going chalk with the, with the pay-per-view. And I'm okay. going to go with uh, and- Andraj and, and Jan uh, That's from, on the, list. From, the, from the pay-per-view. And then my my next fight that I'm going to go with, it, it, it's a tough one. It's a tough call. Um and it's, it's like, are you going to go with the exciting fight? Are you going to go with the higher quality fighter? You know, that's the question that I'm asking myself as I make this pick. And and I think I'm going to have to go with the, with the fight of the night. And and that to me, and it could be the best fight of the month, is Drew Dober and Matt Frivola. We're going to talk about that fight a little later. Um. My only concern about that is for Vol's uh, I question about his chin, and I think it Drew Dover chin checks him and it could be a knockout. Uh I think if Favola wins that matchup, I think it's probably him use, utilizing grappling. But I, I get what you're throwing down there. So we uh so you you've got uh your four picks in. So I've got uh three picks here. So my fourth round. 
Man, I can go a couple different ways. Like there, there's there's one fight I got my eye on that I don't know if you know about. Well, you would know about it if you saw it in the car. I just don't know if you're you're quite ready to go that high with this pick. Um there is oh, a fight on UFC two eighty eight is uh, I'm thinking about, but I'm going to pass on it right now. I'll go. Give me the Bellator 296 main event yeah. of Musasi and Fabian Edwards. And then my next pick, yeah, I'm going to stick on that Bellator card. I'm not going with a lightweight Grand Prix matchup. I'm going to go with Douglas Lima versus Costa Vanstinas. You see, that to me could be the steal of the draft. You know, Lima now uh, at 85. Yeah, he's, he's not cutting that massive amount of weight. Anyone that's ever been around Douglas Lima, bro, dude, he's huge. I remember being around him one time, and I'm like, how the hell do you make 170? I know, man. It, it's crazy when you look at his frame and, and how he's been able to do that for so long. Um, gosh, I uh, this is really hard. This is really hard, but I'm going to stick with the UFC. And I'm going to go with – I'm going to go with Marina Rodriguez and Verna Jandaroba, which is just hidden on the prelims of the paper. Interesting. That, that was not necessarily but, one of the uh, fights on my list. Yeah, it's, it's a fight that I don't think is going to be exciting. But at this point, I'm just trying to take the best quality fighters. Uh, but Verna Jandaroba can be exciting, and Marina is not afraid to stand in trade. Um, so that's the case. And then I think I'm going to, man, I am just, I think for my next fight, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with Evlev and, uh, and, and Diego Lopez from, from UFC 288, man. Interesting. Interesting. You know, of course, uh, uh, Lopez coming back, you know, stepping, taking up this fight on extremely short notice, uh, took the fight on what Tuesday. So, uh, yeah, stepping up there. Um, I'm, I, I, you know, since I only have one 288 fight, I guess I'll go with my, my second 288 fight. We get the return of Cron Gracie, come back after nearly four years away against Charles Jordan. Um, interesting stylistic matchup. Can it, it can Cron get the fight to the ground? We'll talk a little bit about more of that there in a second. Um, give me Mackenzie Dern versus Angela Hill. Yeah, it's another good one. Dern is a star. Hill's a tough fighter. Uh, screw it. I'm going to go star power. This third biggest star of the fight of the whole month of May. Sage Northcutt, who is fighting at 1FC, making his return. I'm going to get him. I'm going to put him up against uh, Ahmed Muchtapa. So it's just the sole purpose of, of getting Sage Northcutt. I believe in him. I saw that video that uh, the fight – fight companion did on him mm-hmm. um i could get i could have got that wrong but uh it was a great video that will harris did and yeah, then anatomy of a fighter anatomy of a fighter yeah he was yeah probably would have got you know got judo throwed uh if someone heard i got that wrong but it was a great great video um the other one that i will go with is I'm going to have to stay away from UFC 288 because my my card looks basically identical, missing the best part. I'm going to go with uh, Tim Means and Alex Morono. I, I think that will be a banker, as the kids say. Yeah, that was one on my list. Um, I'll go with a banger alert. It's two banger. former Bellator guys now in the UFC. Both kind of, you know, they've really changed up their fighting styles since leaving Bellator. Give me Andre Fihilo against Joaquin Buckley. Dude, that could be a good one. That's a good little fight you got there, my man. And, you know, I could really be in a hole right now. But uh, I guess I'm going to take the clean sleep here on Bellator. Give me Premise and, and Mansoor. Of course, I'll be a part of the lightweight Grand Prix. I think that fight's going to suck, but... But Mansour is a pretty good fighter, as is Primus. But I think that fight's going to suck. But I could be totally wrong. Uh, my last two picks, I believe. Drum roll, please. Uh, I'm going to go with Daniel Rodriguez and Ian Gary on that fight night. 
And now I, I only have one last pick. So, you know, I better make it a good one. I'm just kind of looking around. I'm making sure I'm not missing anything, Jason. And I tell you what, oof, I'm looking at some of these fights and, and some of them are kind of catching my interest, kind of catching my fancy. And, you know, I, I want to go flyweight, but I think since I am a resident of the Rio Grande Valley, I got to give one of these dudes on my fight card. I got to give him an opportunity. And uh, I'm going to have to go, Jason, with Diego Ferreira, a man who has a gym where I live. He's taking on Michael Johnson, and uh, I will put him on my fight card. So I got one more pick right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I got if one If you more just pick. want to go with nine fights, you don't have to get another one. Um, You, you know, and, and this is, to me, I'll take another 288 fight, and it's just because of one side of this fight. Give me the Chaos Williams fight. Chaos Williams, I think, is a guy that really pay attention to here at 170 pounds, training with some of the best fighters in Michigan, including Jamal Hill. Uh, he's on the prelims, uh, the TV prelims of UFC 288. That, so that'd be mine. So hopefully I can bounce back after uh, my God awful April. Cause good Lord, I felt good about my, my picks in April. And well, like they really crapped the bed. I think you are the odds on favorite. Honestly, you have, you have Sterling and Cejudo and Johnson and Murray Smith and Walker. Musasi Edwards, Lima versus Vance Dinas, Gracie and Jordan, Dern versus Hill, Philo versus Buckley, Primus, Barnawi, Williams and Bedoya. That's the strong fight card. And mine is Muhammad and Burns, Jaizino Rosenstruck and Almeida, Andraz and Jan, Dober Frivola, Marina Rodriguez and Jandaropa, Evlev and Lopez, Northcutt and Muchtaba. Means Morono, Rodriguez and Gary, and Diego Ferreira and Michael Johnson. You, my friend, are the favorite. Yeah, but I will tell you this. I am looking forward to this main event on, on Saturday night of Aljo and Cejudo. I don't know if you saw this. You know, they did the press conference today and they you know, do the stare downs. So first time I ever noticed this, I don't know if the UFC had Cejudo and Aljo mic'd up, but you could hear the. Uh, the banter back and forth as uh, they were going back and forth with each other. So that was really good. It's over there. Uh, I, I, I want to say I saw it on Facebook. I want to say on, on the UFC reels, uh, but it was really good. And uh, you know, it's one of these things with Henry Cejudo that it's like, what, what should we expect out, out of Cejudo? You know, it's been three years. I mean, think about this. I mean, he was on that May 9th, 2020 card there at UFC 249, which was, you know, that, that first fight card. We haven't seen him since then. And I think that it's, I was thinking about this earlier today, like, you know, and we know how much the UFC has grown in popularity, you know, since 2020. And I think there probably is a lot of people that, that may not be as familiar with Henry Cejudo. And like and the one things I was thinking about Cejudo earlier today was you remember the narrative at one time with Henry Cejudo was, can this guy make weight? Yeah. I remember because one time I went to Houston to watch him fight for legacy fighting championship. And that fight was called off because he missed weight. And you know what he did in his other two legacy fighting championship fights? He missed weight. That was for the 125 pound weight limit, but I believe he's also suffered making weight at bantamweight. If I can recall, I, I could be wrong about that. That could be factually inaccurate, but for sure, when he was making that cut to 125, he had issues. Um, with Henry, the thing is, he turned things around and he did it really quickly, and then he was gone. Right, he had those two losses to DJ. He lost to Joseph Benavides, and then over about a three-year period, he went on an incredible run where he beat up Wilson Hayes, beat up Sergio, won the flyweight championship, defended it, won the bantamweight championship, and defended it and called it a day. So it was a very quick four-fight period where Cejudo established himself as one of the best fighters in the promotion's history. Yeah, I mean, but as I look at this matchup, though, the the one thing that comes is is you've got a massive reach advantage for Aljo in this fight of seven inches. I, I would think that we, I expect Aljo to be the, have the quicker hands between the two. Clearly, the wrestling advantage goes to Henry Cejudo in this one. However, when I think about the grappling side, particularly the jiu-jitsu, 
if somehow Aljo can get on the back of Cejudo, I think Cejudo could be in a little bit of trouble. And like, I'm not sure what to expect. Um, my pick is Henry Cejudo to win this fight just because of knowing how great of a fighter he is. But to me, there's a lot of question marks on, okay, hey, A, how is he going to combat a speed disadvantage in this matchup, having the size disadvantage in this matchup, even though today he's, I don't know if he's trying to play mind tricks or whatnot. He's, he's basically telling Aljo, let's see if you make weight. If you don't wait, make weight. I want to fight Marab instead. I I would be, I mean, look, I expect Aljo to make weight, I, but it's like, to me, I don't know what to expect out of Cejudo, but I do favor him slightly in this matchup, but I also understand that there's there's certain parts of this fight that concern me about how does he overcome certain things. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, Henry Cejudo hasn't fought in three years, basically. He basically hasn't fought since the pandemic has happened. The thing is, Henry's been in the gym. He's been a pivotal part of that fight camp down yep. there. He's been heralded as a genius, as a guy who has remained, you know, a part of the game. And maybe he hasn't lost a step because he's been putting in that work. He put in that work to get to the Olympics. He put in that work to become a champion. He has proven people wrong time and again. He can be cringy. He can look like a doofus. But he also has shown that he can be the best fighter in the world. I think between Cejudo and Aljo, I like Henry's stand-up more in this fight. Henry's stand-up looks better technically, at least when I saw it three years ago. Every physical advantage, in my opinion, is Sterling's, largely due to the fact that he's remained active as a professional fighter, but also because he, to me, is still in his prime age of 33. I could be wrong about this. I do not believe there has ever been a champion that's held the Bantamweight Championship that has been 36 or older at the time. Could be wrong about that, but I don't think that's ever happened. Well, how old was Dominic Cruz back in uh, 2016? Well, how old is he right now? It does- Dominic Cruz is currently 38, so yeah, no, he would he would not have been that yeah. old. And then the, the that, other that was, one that I mean, that was, the fir- yeah. that was the first thing that came to my mind. If the, well, know, he's, that would, he's yeah. the oldest one. He's the oldest one. Yeah. So he won the championship. How old was he when he had the championship? I want to say 2016 was the last time he held the title. So, dude, he must have yeah, been so like. Tw- a- so he lost against Cody Garbrandt December 30th, 2016. I mean, phew, Jesus Christ, that was, uh, what, seven years ago? So Aljo might be the old. I think Aljo's the oldest Bantamweight champion in the promotion's history right now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so I was. Oh, well, I guess, I, yeah. If you tell me this fight hits the championship rounds, I do think it's a it's a Henry Cejudo advantage. I mean, we we have seen Aljo wear down in, in fights. You know, you look at you know he got up early on Jan in his last fight, but you know wore down in, in the fourth and fifth round. Jan you know won on the scorecards on both of those. I mean, uh, I did see Cejudo predicting you know he thinks he finishes within three rounds here. Um, you know, it's it's razor tight on the betting odds. I mean, you can get plus money. At DraftKings with Henry Cejudo at plus one hundred, everywhere else he's minus money. Um, a lot, of, a lot of it is pretty much a pick 'em in terms of this fight. If you're looking to get uh, plus money on on Aljo, the only place uh, according to Best Fight Odds that's got a plus one hundred number on him would be over at Bet Rivers. Uh, this could be a fight that I think if you're betting on the fight, you're in a state where you can bet on the fight. That this could be more of a live betting type opportunity, especially if say Aljo gets up early in the fight to maybe potentially uh, do a live bet there. On Henry Cejudo, but I love this matchup. And then, you know, your your pick of uh, Bilal Muhammad and Goa Burns. It's a great matchup. And also remember, this is a five round fight between these two guys. And massive credit to both these guys to take this fight on short nose and say, let's do our five rounds. Massive kudos here to Gilbert Burns. He could have easily just sat on the sidelines and waited for a title matchup, but he said, No, I'm gonna take this one. But this is also like if you tell me this thing hits the fourth and fifth round, I do think it is advantage Bilal Muhammad. Yeah, he's a really good striker, man. And I think technically he can win three out of those five rounds. And the thing is, his defensive wrestling is top notch. I just don't know how Gilbert's going to be able to bring him down. The deal is, I think Gilbert might be able to rock Muhammad. I really am a big believer in the power of Gilbert Burns. 
And he just impressed me exponentially when he took on Shemaev and he went to war. And he fought like the way he did, even though he, he lost that fight. I'm going with Gilbert Burns, but that's me going to my heart. My brain is telling me Bilal's going to win this fight because he has the ability to keep it standing and outpoint Burns. I think Gilbert's going to take some risk, be aggressive, rock Bilal, and win this fight. The thing is, these guys are putting a lot on the line, but it's never a guarantee that Colby Covington is going to step in that cage. The second Colby Covington pulls out, if he does pull out, of that fight against Leon Edwards, the winner of this fight is guaranteed to fight for the title, unless Bilal Muhammad wins. In that case, the UFC will probably screw him over again, and he won't fight for the title. I, I was looking at Bilal Muhammad over at UFCStats.com, and, and the names of the people that have been able to take down Bilal, Bilal might surprise you a little bit. This first name, I don't think it would really shock you at all. Uh, it was a takedown by Damian Maia. He got one takedown back in their matchup in 2021. That one, I think, doesn't really shock you. Uh, the other names, Takashi Sato, not a guy you would expect to be able to take down below Muhammad. Yeah. And then the other one is another name that you would not expect to be able to take the fight to the ground. You got to go back to 2017, Jordan Mean. Yeah, Jordan, Jordan Mean and Takashi Sato. Are those the only three people that have taken him down? Yeah, yeah, they're the only three. Oh my gosh. I wonder what those takedowns looked like. Um, and I guarantee you that both me and Sato weren't in top position for that long when the fight went down there. Yeah, I mean I mean look, I think if you're if you're a Bilal, you have to stay away from the grappling exchanges. You you gotta keep this thing on the feet because you just don't you don't want to play with jujitsu on the mat with Gilbert Burns. And um, you know, and but I do think Gilbert is a guy that has more fight ending potential in this one, but it's it's one of these ones and, and this is another fight that is pretty much a straight pick him across the board here. Um you do get a little bit of plus money on, on Bilal Muhammad, plus one ten, plus one oh five, plus one hundred. Um the best number you get on Gilbert Burns right now is uh, I'm seeing a minus one twenty five is out there on him but uh but i mean it's i think it's a very close matchup i do i slightly lean muhammad and and it's because of the five round nature if you told me this was a three round fight i don't think my pick i think my pick would be gilbert burns but i think the five round nature if this does get to round four round five that's why i do pick below muhammad Dude, we are different. We are different. When you look at those top two fights, I'm going Burns by decision. I'm going Aljo Sterling by second round submission. Okay, so right. you you got Cejudo. You got Muhammad. I got Burns. I got Sterling. I wonder, you know, I, are we are we agreeing the rest of this fight card? Like, who do you got between Jan and Andraj? Who's your pick there, man? <sighs> This is a tough one for me. So, by the way, I don't know if you saw uh, Jessica Andrade when she did her media day. Uh, she's changed up her fight kit. Uh, she is going away from the sports bra. She's going to the shirt because she does not want a, a wardrobe malfunction. Oh, yeah, that's true. We did cover that extensively uh, the last time she fought, which yeah. was not good. But she also probably went up against, um, you know, the future champ, so, Aaron Blanchfield. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, after that fight was over, really word came out of Las Vegas that she just wasn't healthy heading in that one, a little bit of a hand injury. She's taking some time off on this one. Um, You know, the crazy thing about Jessica Andrade is how long she's been in the UFC. She's been in the UFC for 10 years. She made her debut in 2013 against Liz Carmouche. Wow, look at that. Who won? Andrade? (laughs) No, uh, Liz won uh, be a second round TKO. I mean, you, you look at some of the names that Jessica Andrade has fought throughout her UFC career. Notable names: Raquel Pennington. Uh, I you, you have to say the rest. Pacheco is now a notable name with what she's done uh, there in the PFL. Uh, Jessica Penne, uh, jo, Jojo Wood, Angela Hill, Yuani Jasha, Claudia Gadelli, Atisha Torres, Caroline Kovalevich, Rose Namajunas, Zhang Wali, uh, Kayla Jukagi, and Valentina Shevchenko. Uh, you know, man, Lamos, Lauren Murphy, and now Aaron Blanchfield, who could eventually be the, the champion of this division here. Um, I, I think it's a smart pick is Andrade, but I'm st- I do kind of wonder, are we potentially maybe seeing the, the downside of, of Andrade's career? There aren't a lot of female fighters that were around when Andrade made her debut that are still around. 
but it's crazy to think about how long her career has been and the fact that she's still 31 years old, right? Yeah. She's two years younger than Aljamain Sterling. That being said, um, age isn't the only factor when it comes to wear and tear. Fighting at a UFC level for a decade adds a lot of wear and tear. I think Andrade is my pick largely due to the fact that she rarely ever loses back-to-back fights. She's only lost back-to-back fights one time. That's when she fought Zhang in Rose Namahunas. And the story of Andrade's career is she comes out and looks like a world beater, puts people away with her powerful strikes, her violent ground and pound. You talk yourself into her becoming a champion, and then she ultimately falls short. You know, she has had that belt around her waist before, but uh, I don't think she will have it again. I'm picking on Draj against Jan. I think the reason why is I think if she gets in that top position, she's going to have a lot of success. The big problem is on Draj striking defense looked like crap against Aaron Blanchfield. If Andrade puts her head on a platter, I don't care what kind of injury she had. I don't think she had a broken neck where she couldn't move her head, and she didn't move her head. She kept it straight in front of Aaron Blanchfield. So if she keeps it straight in front of Aaron Blanchfield, Jan's going to beat her up and she's going to win a decision. That being said, I'm still going to be a believer, and I think Andrade gets a win here with the volume and power of her strikes. I also do win with Andrade if this thing does get into the third round. Does she wear down a little bit? Now, before we get into our rest, our UFC 288 breakdown and picks, do want to let you know about our other sponsor this week, and that is Sunday Lawn Care. I mean, look, I live here in Florida, and, uh, you know, it might be a competition in your neighborhood. It seems to be a little competition in my neighborhood on whose yard looks the best. And you got to take advantage of the offer that Sunday has for the MMA Report podcast listener as it's time to reclaim your weekend. Sunday Lawn Care can get to can take one thing off your to-do list and man i know i can do things off my to-do list instead of spending time working on your yard with sunday you can spend time enjoying it and the one thing that i love about sunday lawn care is when you go over to get sunday.com slash ma report all you gotta do is enter your address to get a customized plan created just for your lawn it can be overwhelming man to take care of your lawn to get it to be that dream lawn that you want. Like, it's like, how do I do it? All you need is a hose with Sunday, bro. All you need is a hose to apply Sunday. You can fertilize your whole lawn in a short, short period of time, man. You're not going to the store. You just order it online. It's coming to you and it's easy. It's affordable, right? Some people spend over $1,500 a year to make their lawn look immaculate with Sunday full season plan for just a hundred and nine dollars, man, a hundred and nine dollars. That's less than $10 a month. Sunday also has ingredients. You can feel just spectacular about, right? There are no harsh chemicals. There's no long waiting periods. You don't need to worry about your kids or your pets to be off the lawn. You just apply it. You let it dry and you're back to enjoying your yard. And guess what? You're going to have the best looking yard in your entire neighborhood. And for a limited time, Sunday is offering our listeners 50% off your first box. So you can get started today for as little as $55. When you go to get sunday.com slash MMA report at checkout, that's 50% off your first box at get sunday.com slash MMA report. And of course, uh, the link will be here in the show notes. So be sure to take advantage of that offer they have over there. Now, when we look at the rest of UFC 288, we mentioned about Mo. Uh, I got to ask you a question. Th- Go ahead. I got to ask you a question. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to just a hard, hard, hard pivot. Hard. I'm, I'm just in the paint. Three point stance and I'm using my forearm. Jason, which fighter on this fight card is going to use the hot new MMA tactic to win their fight? Do you know the hot new MMA tactic I'm talking about? <laughs> what? Who's going to headbutt the hell out of their opponent and get a TKO win? <laughs> Who is going to do that? I saw freaking Song do it. I, I saw uh, uh, Bobby Green go after it. Jason, can we tell the officials on this fight card to open their eyes and when they see one dude headbutt another at UFC 288 to stop the action so the officials, the judges know not to give points to the guy who illegally landed the headbutt. I'm so tired of seeing it. There is some knockout candidates that really stick out to me on this card. Uh, one is Drew Dober against Matt Pervola. Yeah. Uh Braxton Smith making his UFC debut. Uh, to say uh, Braxton loves to throw them bungalows 
Oh, he loves to throw his bungalows. Um, I don't look. The only question I have about Braxton Smith is if this fight lasts more than two minutes, does he have the cardio? Because I mean, bro, you go back and you watch his film. I mean, he throws, I mean, just flinging like you think Roy Nelson throwing those overhands. Yeah. Braxton Smith. He's, he's got those overhands. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, hopefully, hopefully we have no commission issues. Oh my gosh. By the way, I, so I, I had a, I had Zach Cummings on the podcast on Sunday or Monday show. He told me something that I thought was insane. So what? he has his own promotion. He does shows in the state of Kansas and the state of Missouri because he lives in Kansas City and you know he's right on the border there. He was telling me that if you are a official working an event in Missouri, that you cannot have any affiliation with a MMA gym in Missouri, which led me to this question. Then how do you know what techniques work and what don't? How do you know what the hell you're talking about? Right? I, I when you're- he told me that I was I was floored. I could not believe that. I, I I understand it. I get it. But also I'm like, I want my referees and my judges to like know what it's like to be in a rear naked choke, what it's like to be in an arm bar, what it's like to, you know, get hit up with a, a you know a one two. Who are these people that are judging fights then? What is their background? <laughs> And Dude, it goes it goes back to that 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 referee in Texas at Fury last month when he clearly had no I mean the guy could have died. Yeah. Yeah, I mean look the line and, and then he's working a there. UFC event the next goddamn night. I know, I know. That was honestly I wonder what happened with that dude. I wonder if he's still I wonder I'll, if he's done a thing there was, since the weekend. There was a referee, this is years ago here in the state of Florida, where he it was just known, like, pe- fighters just did not want him refereeing a fight. And I remember a, a regional promoter uh, telling me that they literally went to the commission goes, he can work the event, he can be an inspector, he can be working cage side, but he ain't stepping in that ring. He is not a referee tonight. And the commission listened. Damn. What the hell? So people just thought that dude wasn't going to stop the oh, fight on awful. time? Oh, God. He was awful. He was awful. I mean, like, look, when you go to regional MMA, you see bad refereeing. You see bad judging. Yeah, because who in their right – a high-quality judge is not going to be judging your regional well, MMA card. Yeah, I mean, they don't I have think- the time of day to do it. It's that, and also, like, look, the, and the one thing I'll say is, is these people working regional MMA – they clearly love they love mixed martial arts. There's not a doubt yes. in my mind because you're not doing it for the money. I mean, let, let's and I'll say this right now: I do not want to be a judge. I do not want to be a referee. No, no, I'm good. I'm good. I don't yeah, want the that. only thing I the only thing I want to judge is a chicken wing because look at how that judge's life turned upside down at that uh, the UFC judge in Texas who had that awful. I mean, excuse me. The, uh, the referee who had that awful thing where he didn't break the choke. In one night, his life turned upside down. People knew his name. They went on his social media. They knew all this information. And, yes, he completely and totally royally screwed up. No doubt about it. That's one of the worst officiating things I've ever seen in my life. But he doesn't deserve to have a, a miserable life because of it. He doesn't deserve to be in the cage at a VOC event. That's for damn sure. But that's the thing. You're a referee, you're a judge. There's that opportunity where you could be in that microscope and be in that pressure cooker that is 2023 in social media. Well, and the problem is, is when we're talking about the way fighters are paid in mixed martial arts, if a a wrong decision is made, you've you've lost that second paycheck. I mean, that that's just it's the unfortunate part of the way fighter pay is, but that's the reality of it. I mean, so let's just hope. Let's just hope we have no issues uh, coming up this week. Uh, you know, mentioned about Evelev and Lopez. Look, if Evelev, Evelev should be able to go out there and just take down Diego Lopez at will. He should be. Uh, I mean, look, I think he's a 9-1 to one betting favorite in this one. Uh, yeah, uh, so anywhere from a, uh, the lowest is a 7-1 to one favorite. The highest is an 11-1 to one favorite. The 11-1 favorite over there at, at FanDuel Sportsbook. He, he should be he, he should be able to take Lopez down without a question. Um, but, I mean, look, I, I heard someone um, say this on the podcast this week. We're talking about men getting in the underwear and fighting cage. Anything can happen. Yeah, anything can happen. 
I'm rooting for Gracie to get a win. I really want to see a Gracie have success in the UFC in the year 2023. Oh, you you're, know? you just you pass you passing over to Lopez. You're like screw him. I'm going on to the next fight. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, look, I don't think Lopez is going to win that fight, brother. I, I think Evlev is one of the best featherweights on the planet. I mean, I think he's a top uh-huh. 15 Walter, uh, featherweight on the planet. I don't think Lopez has a shot against Evlev. I have him on the fight on my fight night, but I think it's going to be easy work for Mavsar. Yeah, he, he could get grapple left to death. Yeah, I mean, that's to me what's going to happen. I mean, anything could happen in this cage. The fight could happen. Diego could come in. I know he's been really successful in Mexico, and I love – my Mexican mixed martial arts fighters as a as a you know a man of Hispanic background of 15 minutes from Mexico I'll be rooting for Lopez but I I just think it's 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 a tough debut bro it, yeah, it's so, a really tough debut yeah sometime not not the greatest I wanted to look over at prize picks let me see what the, they they do not have a takedown prop I was interested to see if they had a takedown prop or what that might be but uh, they don't they don't have a takedown prop uh, in terms of that one I mean look if I told you Evelev lands. Three and a half takedowns, more or less. I would I would go under because I think the fight gets finished. Yeah, it's good I think he gets top position and gets that ground and pound. And I'm not confident in Lopez's ability to scramble back up. I mean, it's it's easier nowadays to scramble back up than before. There's so many different techniques. It's been such a priority of mixed martial arts to get back up off that takedown that you see so many great techniques to get back up, but. To me, there's a massive gap in talent. That's why you're looking at this fight, and the odds are so wide. I mean, Evlev's literally uh, at FanDuel. He's a minus 1,100 favorite against Diego Lopez. That being said, as you mentioned, anything can happen. We've seen wider upsets happen in this sport. I just don't think this will be one of them. You know, as you were trying to get ahead to uh, Cron Gracie, yeah. uh, for, we have not seen Cron Gracie since 2019 when he lost against Cub Swanson, taking on Charles Jordan here. I mean, look, it, this is a, a question of can Gracie get this matchup to the ground and take down defense has been an issue. Now, I've always said this. Jiu-Jitsu artists, I think, do not have very good takedowns for the most part. You know, so if, if Jordan can keep this one fight on the feet, I think he should win. But when you look at his issues that he's had, again, the takedown defense, Nathaniel Wood, who is obviously a takedown guy, took him down five times. Shane Burgos, who I don't think any of us necessarily would not consider him a Mr. Wrestler. Uh, he had two takedowns. Lando Veneta had a takedown against him. Andre Ull had a takedown against him. Julian Rosa had two takedowns against him. Marcelo Rojo had a takedown against him. Andre Feely had five. Desmond Green had four. I named a lot of matchups for Charles Jordan when he got taken down. Uh, so you're telling me his defense is a little worse than Bilal Muhammad's wrestling defense. There is only two people who have not taken Charles Jordan down. Duho who? Choi and Josh Kulabau. Did they try and take him down? Let me uh, let me pull up the. Uh, I'm sure Troy. I'm sure Troy did it. I'm sure Troy did it. I think Josh Kulabau could have. Kulabau was 0 for seven in takedown attempts. Duho Choi uh, did not attempt. 0 for zero. Yeah. So only one dude tried to take him down and couldn't do it, and he's not <laughs> in the UFC right now. You you sold it. Cron Gracie's the pick. Look, the thing is, Gracie's are usually disappointments when it comes to mixed martial arts after the year 2005. There's been a couple exceptions. Hodge Gracie had a pretty good run in strike force. Kron has had some success in the UFC. And Neiman Gracie has been pretty good in Bellator. Kron's pretty talented. This is a winnable fight for him. You make a great case. He gets us to the ground. He gets a submission. He is a bit of a dog on the betting odds. But I'm all aboard the Kron train. He's also got a great first name to go along with the Gracie name. I, I love me some Kron Gracie. Look, I think if you're Jordan, I think that it's about getting us out of the first round, testing the cardio of Kron in this one. But look, if if Kron can get this one to the ground, he should he should be able to get a submission. Um, you know, Jordan. I mean, this is it's not a pick that I'm extremely confident in here. Um, I don't mind taking the underdog in Kron Gracie. Yeah, but obviously, so. oh, uh, let me put the asterisk next to it. If he doesn't get a takedown, he's not winning this fight. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's going to come out here and, and uh, beat Jordan on the feet because Jordan's actually just a good striker straight up, and and Kron isn't. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty clear advantage for Kron on the ground, man. Um, 
I uh, I'm glad this fight card got Bilal and Burns, bro, because it really needed it after Oliver and Dariush went out. Yeah. And now that it has Muhammad Burns, you know, it's a main card I'm excited for. It really is. It, it's not the best pay per view of the year. It might, in fact, be the worst pay per view of the year in terms of like fighter quality on the main card. But it's still a good pay per view, and I am excited to see it. I, I really like the layout. And then you look at this Matt Pervola matchup, uh, you know, taking on Drew Dober here. This is a, uh, it's a different clash of styles. I mean, look, it, Pervola has not made it out of the first round in his last three matchups. Uh, that was, he's coming, he's got back to back wins, a TKO win against uh, Azatar, TKO win against Valdez. And prior to that was that knockout loss to Terrence McKinney. Um, I don't have a ton of confidence in terms of Matt Pervola's chin in this one. Um, Drew Dober is a, is a heavy puncher. To me, this is either Dober knocks him out within two or this is a three-round decision for Matt Favol by using his wrestling. I think Drew Dober knocks him out in that first round. I think Drew Dober is on another level right now. Yeah, uh, He, to me, is just – he's had a long UFC career and it really comes across that he's going on his run right this second. And so I'm going Drew Dober first-round knockout. Do think Favola will throw some strikes at him. Don't think he'll be able to bring it to the ground. Um, you know, looking kind of at the, at the prelims here, some of the things that, that stick out to me, um, I think Devin Clark's an interesting underdog. He's got to get this fight up against the fence against Kenny and Jack, who that one kind of sticks out to me. Uh, I mentioned about Braxton Smith. Uh, he is a haymaker. Um, if he's going to go out there and beat Parker Porter, it's going to be in the first round. But if Parker Porter, Porter survives that early swarm, I, I would think Parker Porter probably either finish him second or third round or walks his way. Uh, to a decision in that one. Uh, Joseph Holmes, to me, is another interesting underdog in terms of this preliminary card. Of course, we did lose the Daniel Santos, Johnny Munoz Jr. fight earlier today. Santos uh, pulled out of the fight uh, today. You mentioned about the Maria Rodriguez, Evander Janaroba fight. I mentioned about Chaos Williams. Uh, Phil Hall is also on this card. Um, you know, it's a, it's overall, it's, it's a decent prelim card. It's not a great one. Marina and Janderoba makes it pretty good. Again, that's a main card quality fight. Marina was literally a fight away from challenging for the championship, and she lost a close decision in her last fight. Verna also is coming off a big win over Angela Hill. Um, that's a good fight to go along with the Frivola Dober fight. Chaos Williams is also a good fight on those prelims. I, I like Marina against Verna. Um, I think those early prelims kind of suck. Like Zalga Zumagulov and Raphael Estevam is not a very good fight. Look, I'm not excited for that one. The, you know, you could UFC 288 is another example of why you never believe retirements in MMA. Zalgas had announced a retirement at one point. Cejudo announced a retirement at one point. That's why you just never believe that R word. I told that to Zach Cummings. I go, Zach, I don't believe this R word. He didn't necessarily yeah. convince me. He didn't necessarily convince me, even though he's like, he goes, I just don't think I can go out better than how I went out. There's one dude I know that's retired for sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure James Krause isn't going to fight again. <laughs> that I was thinking about that. I was like, do you think James Krause showed up at UFC Kansas City? You would think no. if he did, someone would have had pictures. Yeah, they would have that machine that James Dolan has at Madison Square Garden that identifies people he doesn't want in his arena and makes them not in. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think somewhere at UFC security, James Krause's face is on there, and they're like, "Do not let this man in anywhere, it, no matter it, how sick his picks are." It's so surprising to me how his name still gets mentioned on Bellator broad or a, a UFC broadcast. Yeah, well, dude, he had an incredible influence among that Kansas City scene. Okay. Like, like the thing about James Krause is. He had a hell of a fight camp, you know. Obviously, mm -hmm. he 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 had some loose lips apparently, or something went wrong. But he had a hell of a fight camp, and his fingerprints are all over that UFC roster. I did find it interesting that James Gallagher uh, put it on his Instagram within, let's say, well, last week, week and a half, that he uh, he's leaving the states to head back to SPG, and I wonder how much of that is related to what's going on there in uh, in Kansas City. Yeah, I think that has to be a huge factor. I think he came for Kraus. If that's no longer an option, going back to SPG is just a, is a great option for him. Yeah, I mean, it's one of these things of any time that I've had a chance to interview someone that trained at Glory, 
I, I do. I I find a way to kind of bring up the question, but not a you know, directly mention James Krause's name. Yeah, and just see and just see what they say, because like, look, I can go on Instagram, and I and I can see the backdrop. I'm like, yeah, that is still glory. Like, I know you're still there. It may be another name, but that is glory. Yeah, and it just makes you wonder what what Krause has been up to. You know, what's he been up to? What's Jeff Molina been up to lately? You know, where's the investigation going on with this? And what is the investigation actually going to prove? What if it proves nothing, right? You know, James just loses his entire reputation, you know, because of nothing. Now, that being said, I'm pretty sure something went on, Dude, right? The betting odds. We're like six flipped. months into this. Yeah. This was like, like what, what November? The hell November, December of last year? Yeah. It's, I re- it was definitely December because I remember I was going Christmas shopping. It may have been November because I may have been going shopping for my girlfriend's birthday. Um, it was around that time period, though. I remember it was cold as hell whenever it all went down, whenever – who who was the fighter that was he was supposed to be in his corner when it all oh. went down? I interviewed the guy. He won the fight too because he mentioned it in his post fight interview. I just looked. Yeah, I, I I remember I interviewed the guy. I'm having a complete brain fart on who it is, but I remember he Miles talked Johns. about Miles, Miles Johns, Johns. Yeah, because Miles Johns had just moved to Glory. He was yeah. there um, at, at Fortis, but he has family in Kansas, so he wouldn't be closer to his family uh, in Kansas, in, in the Chicago area. So that's why he went there. But, yeah, yeah, it's... Dude, he he hasn't fought since then, November 20, 2022. I feel, but he like, does he, have a fight I feel like he had a fight booked, and it got canceled. Like, uh, I want to say well, he pulled out or something. He currently has a fight in June up against Rowan E. Barcelos at uh, UFC on ESPN 46. Yeah, but I mean, like you, it's, I mean, the Jeff Molina aspect of this, I mean, outside of, we really haven't gotten a ton of really information on, on that with the exception of the fact that he is um, currently temporarily suspended by the Nevada State Athletic Commission, which is related to this, which to me tells me there's something there. There's something that the people think. I mean, I, I don't know if you've seen the story, what's going on with the Alabama baseball coach that was fired today. I mean. No, I didn't see that. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you know, allegedly may have been involved in, you know, telling somebody to make a bet against his own team. Allegedly. Holy crap. Someone texted me about it. I saw a TikTok video where it basically, it relies to some guy in Cincinnati placing a six figure bet. And I guess, uh, well, I guess, yeah, it's safe to say people really don't bet six figures on college baseball. Yeah, if someone bets six figures on college baseball, it should just be not allowed. Well, I, I, you're just telling yourself at this point. Yeah, you totally are, right? But, if you I, have like I think a- it's, but I think it's also one of these things, and for just being completely honest about it, as sports betting becomes more accessible throughout the United States, that I think we're going to see more and more stories about it. I mean... I mean, you tell me that there's not someone backstage at a UFC event that sees a fire warming up and goes, mm, "You don't look very good." Yeah, or I'm pretty you, sure yeah. I'm pretty I, sure I, sports betting is legalized in state of New Jersey. For, you know, so is somebody this weekend gonna be in the back going, "Man, that person don't look good warming up." I'm gonna place a bet on their opponent. Yeah, man. All you gotta do is send a text to somebody too to put a bet on there. Mm-hmm. You know. It's the thing is, if you're James Krause or if you're someone that gets investigated by the FBI, you send that text message, that don't go away. No. Everything digital has a footprint. People will find that up and the FBI will dig it up, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard to protect your information. Hell, the US government couldn't even do it <laughs> when it came to that kid who leaked it on Discord. So you think you're going to? Nah, bro. Everything that he texted, everything that he messaged, that's out there. That, that's that's something that the FBI can find. And maybe that's why the investigation is taking so long because it is a long process. And we both know that there's an incredible amount of bureaucracy in, in, in that type of work 
right? It, it takes a while for the laws and the hands of justice to to turn. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like any day now we're just gonna see some report on ESPN that's gonna outline everything that's happened. Like, and you just, you know, it, it to me, it's a, it's a more of how deep does it go? Yeah, you yeah. Know. How deep does it go? Who else has bet on it? Uh, other than, is that the who? FBI at your door because they see some of your text the, messages? The, <laughs> The, the FBI has been listening into the podcast and they got to look at my, past, I mean, but, I uh, mean, look, you know, I might've been on Facebook and I might've seen, you know, you're getting back in a ring here in a couple weeks. Yeah, man. I'm actually going to have two matches back to back days. Uh, one in Laredo and a tag team match. Okay. I'm wrestling a guy who the last time I saw him wrestle, he stapled a dollar bill into a dude's forehead. So hopefully he doesn't oh. do it to me. That was a no disqualification match, though. So my match does, in fact, have a disqualification. <laughs> and then uh, uh, the day after, I'm going to be wrestling at this event called South Texas Wrestle Fest in a gauntlet match. I'll be one of the entrants, and uh, I don't know. Th- there should be some uh, famous WWE wrestlers that are at this event. Former WWE wrestlers at the uh, at the Comic Con I just wrestled at. Mick Foley was out there. But okay. he uh, he didn't wrestle. Uh, we were outside, and uh, he he did not go and watch us wrestle. But if he did go out and watch us wrestle, I was prepared to do a crazy Mick Foley esque move. I was prepared to jump, you know, on the outside, which I did do a dive to the outside of my match. But uh, yeah, so we're working on it, and uh, I'm excited to wrestle again. I I did hurt my shoulder a little bit in training yesterday, but. That's the thing. You just uh, you shake it off and you get back to training, man. It's it's a fun journey. Yeah, don't don't be like Juliana Pena, you know, break your rib and now all of a sudden you're out for God knows how much longer because we see how long it took to get this trilogy match, chat. I know, bro. I know. You got to feel for her. You know, who knows if she's going to be able to get that fight again. Um, you know, maybe Aldana comes in and just steals her thunder and, and, and gets that championship back. Right, maybe the motivation isn't there for Amanda uh, against Irene as it was for Juliana. Irene's a hell of a stand-up fighter. She's got great technique, a much better technical striker than Juliana Pena. Better challenge for Amanda. By the way, uh, so tomorrow is Cinco de Mayo, so a lot of people are probably going to be listening to this show on, on Cinco de Mayo. Do, do you I, see Cinco de Mayo celebration has been a big part of my life just because of working in radio marketing. So every Cinco de Mayo, I'd have like three or four different bar gigs. Or, or, is Cinco yeah. de Mayo a big, uh, you know, let's go out and have some fun in the Rio Grande for you? It, for me personally, no. I'm just not a big party guy. Usually when I drink, it's alone in a dark room and I'm watching guys in underwear wrestle each other. But. For a lot of people where I'm from, it's a great time to party. Um, a lot of people go out and hang out with friends. They go out to the bars. They club. Cinco de Mayo is a big deal, really, across the entire state of Texas, but in particular where I'm from, which is right across the border. I uh, got you know home sec- secretary of the DHS coming in tomorrow to check out the situation. But uh, if he uh, decides to stop by the bars, he'll find plenty of people drinking. As for me, I work the night shift on Cinco de Mayo, so um, I will not partake in the festivities. But maybe at the end of my shift, I'll get myself a Dos Equis or a Corona or a Modelo. And I'm a Modelo I'll guy. I'm one. a Modelo guy. I, I, can, I can drink Corona, but I can, I can only have like, I don't know. After like two or three Coronas, I'm good. Modelos, those things go down like water. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe, maybe I'll get a Modelo. And uh, watch, but, some, I, but uh, I'm also bougie. I, I got to put the lime in, in the bottle too. So I mean, I'm, I'm a little bougie like that. Damn, a man, a, a veteran right there, a veteran of the drinking game. I, uh, I love me an orange slice and a blue moon, but I definitely won't cut that up. So you know, that's only happening if I go to B Dubs. Yeah, I, I actually, I gotta, I gotta see what bars in Tallahassee have the fights on Saturday because uh, if not, I guess I'll just we got an Airbnb. Maybe uh, we have good, some good internet in an Airbnb and. Uh, that's probably how I'll take it in. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, I, I work the broadcast for 
the Vipers and the Toros, the soccer and basketball teams down here. And our crew is having a little party actually on Saturday. So I might have to talk them into to getting a TV out there and I'll buy the fights and I'll show the fights to my friends. That might be what, what my move is because I do want to watch these fights live. I do want to watch that main event live. There's a lot of questions to be answered with Suhudo's return against Aljo Sterling. I am, I am hyped. All I know is we're going to have a really cringy post-fight interview no matter who wins. I think here's a question. Aljo wins. Does he fight at 35 again? It seems like it's time, you know, to, to, to give up, you know, the reins to the 135-pound weight class to his teammate who's patiently waited for him. Like, for is him Volkanovsky potentially the biggest winner here? I mean, obviously, he's got to fight against Yair coming up here in a little bit. But it seems like both these guys would make sense to move up the 45 to take on him. I mean, Suhudo's already calling it. Yeah. Yeah, I think Volk's the biggest winner here. But, you know, he's got to get past Yair. And, and Yair could absolutely beat Volkanovski, especially after Volk had that fight against Islam. It's hard to rebound it after a loss like that. And for Volkanovski, he's held that championship for a long time. There is that wear and tear. He also isn't a spring chicken either. So, for Volk, yeah, absolutely. But, um, you know, who would you favor has a better chance against Volkanovski, Cejudo or Aljamain Sterling at 145? Ooh. Probably Aljo. Yeah, I think so, I, I just too, I, wonder about the, I wonder about the size aspect with Cejudo. Yeah. What would he look like? You know, what would he look like as a 45-er as opposed to what – We've seen him as a 25 and 35-er. But, like, if you – I don't know if I'd want to bet against a Cejudo in that scenario. Bet against him, you usually get proven wrong. Yeah. That's been the story of Henry's life, his entire life. Yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah. But uh, we do appreciate everyone tuning in for this episode. Be sure to check out the deals that Harry's and Sunday's has for the MA Report podcast mm-hmm. listener. Of course, uh, whether you listen to us uh, on the podcasting side, like – rate review all that stuff of course if you watch this on youtube hit that thumbs up button it really does help us out a lot as well uh no sunday edition of the podcast coming up this week myself and dan will be back next week we'll recap what happened at ufc 288 also get you ready for ufc charlotte next week of course headlined by that heavyweight matchup of rosenstruck and almeida